Welcome, everyone. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US, and I want to welcome all of you on the call today. This is the third in a series that we've been doing with John Young. This one is Culture Repair. The other two, uh, the first was Storytelling, the second was on Peacemaking, and those are available on our website as archives and available for your listening at another time. And I wanted to turn it over now to John Young. And John, thank you so much. Third in a tremendously wonderful series. And uh, this one is on culture repair. I wanted to um, ask you if you'd tell us a bit about yourself and your work at the onset, and then take us into how we can repair our culture, which is so needed at this time. So over to you, John. Great. Thanks, Caroline. Off we go. Well, so my name is John Young, and this is, um, as uh, Caroline's already said, the third uh, in a series here that we've done. And um, I encourage you to go ahead and listen to those other two if you haven't already. Uh, I will refer to them from this uh, particular topic as well. They laid a foundation for us. The first one was on storytelling and how it benefits leadership, and the second one was on peacemaking and how that leads into culture repair. So these three are, form a little bit of an ecology, uh, though I'm sure you'll enjoy what, what I have to say t today, even if you don't get to hear those. Um, my work uh, takes me pretty much around the world. Uh, I haven't been to Australia or South America yet, but I've been working with Australian people um, through long-distance mentoring for a couple years now. Um, I am an author, uh, lecturer, consultant, teacher, mentor. My specialty is mentoring, um, and I have, uh, for instance, uh, long-term mentoring relationships with people that have lasted now 25 years, and I continue to uh, ad adopt people that I mentor and work with them. I greatly believe in the power of mentoring, and as you'll soon come to discover, it's a big part of culture repair. Uh, I work in the field of deep nature connection, which is a little bit different from, say, what you might think of as environmental education or science outside, you know, where you're bringing people outside and, and learning about things and um, learning the names of stuff and learning technical details. Um, I'm much more oriented in what brings people into deep relationship with things. and. Um, when they develop a deep relationship, how that stimulates understanding and uh, connection. That connection always leads to knowledge, and knowledge leads to information and skill. So um, mentoring is the, the facilitating process by which people develop connection. And my career has been devoted to understanding how cultural mentoring systems build the nature connection in cultures worldwide. Um, and my my vision is to bring back deep nature connection and all of its positive healthful attributes uh, to people worldwide in all communities everywhere and creating uh, supportive cultural systems around individuals so that people can enjoy regenerative health and vitality and renewed relationship with the ecosystems around them and thereby providing, you know, uh, intrinsic values and vision in, in individuals to help them learn how to take care of their their wild and natural places around them. So essentially kind of re restoring the original instructions for humanity would be a way to summarize that. Um, I've run Nature Connection programming uh, since 1983 officially and began my career in 1978. Nature Connection work through the Tracker School in New Jersey. Um, I was mentored through boyhood, um, both by my elders from my family, which came from old country Europe, farming, um, settled over here, and then helped to raise me and my sister close to nature. And then uh, Tom Brown worked with me from the age of 10 to the age of 17 before he wrote his first book, The Tracker. Um, so I then studied anthropology and natural history through university, spent five years at Rutgers University, and um, studied intensely human behavior and human culture, trying to understand how to strengthen people's relationship with nature through uh, cultural mentoring. And 
founded a school in 1983 called Wilderness Awareness School uh, that took on that work. And somewhere around the late 80s, early 90s, I began to train, train adults in this work and formally began teaching something called the Art of Mentoring in 1995. And uh, since 95, we've run oh, probably 100 or so Art of Mentorings worldwide, uh, maybe more, um, and related programming. Um, and this year, I just got back a couple days ago from uh, a Art of Mentoring in the uh, United Kingdom. And you could actually look at that called Art of Mentoring UK is the website if you wanted to learn more. I know that we had someone who works close with Rob Hopkins there for most of the week. And she had to leave on Friday because she had to make a presentation in London on Saturday. But Art of Mentoring and Transition Town work is really uh, closely allied. And I know if, if you understand permaculture, and I'm sure most of you uh, have experienced permaculture and understand the teachings of permaculture, you've heard about or learned about what's called invisible structures. Uh, invisible structures are the things that weave community together that, that cause things to grow in social sectors so that uh, projects can have a chance of surviving and growing. And we, we focused on that a little bit last week. Um, Art of Mentoring work has expanded worldwide, similar to the way the permaculture design courses are now worldwide. And we're helping to train leadership to run Art of Mentorings worldwide, and that's what's going on right now. There's uh, well over 200 organizations that are using H Shields Cultural Mentoring as a model to serve adults and children alike. Um, I see by looking down the list of people on the call that a number of you are on the call. So thanks for joining me here today or joining us here today in supporting this uh, important work in Transition Town. One person I see on the list here is um, Pete Bergen, who's from north of the Big Red Bridge here in California, Sonoma, Marin County area. And he'll be running some really neat stuff at Terra Firma Farms in, Pet in the Petaluma area. Um, and uh, that particular farm, I'll be speaking there this um, Wednesday night, July 6th. For anybody who's around, I'll be doing a talk on the Kalahari Bushman that night, and again, looking at some cultural pair, repair stuff that night as well. And uh, Pete does some great work in that region. There's a lot of good stuff happening right now in the Marin Sonoma County area. And um, if, uh, in a little bit here, I'd love to call on Pete to tell us a little bit about his program. And if they want to know how to get to the talk on Wednesday night, they can get there. You can give a quick announcement on that, and then your offerings that you're running in the region. Um, I call on Pete specifically because he's a model example of someone who's actively pursuing culture repair work. He's actually um, uh, really good at, at working on the invisible structures piece and bringing community together. Um, and I know that the Friends of the Petaluma River and Dave Yearsley will be involved uh, on Wednesday night as well. And we'll be using that, uh, those uh, organizations up there to help spread the work of Nature Connection Mentoring in the region. So sometimes I wish I lived in Marin County, but here I am in Santa Cruz County and enjoying it. So let's see. Today is culture repair. And in my last talk, I talked about peacemaking and just wanted to revisit something um, from last week that peacemaking is sort of a foundation piece for culture repair. And I guess what I really need to do is first explain to you what I mean by culture repair and also the, just really looking at the word culture itself. And I've said uh, already a couple of times now in these last in this series that um, if you went to Wikipedia and looked at the definition of culture, you would find that you would leave the definition of culture off of Wikipedia more confused than when you got there. It goes on for pages and pages and pages, and it doesn't really explain to you what culture is. It sort of gets lost in details. And it talks about the work of an uh, anthropologist by the name of Boaz, and um, he mentions that there's you know dozens and dozens of definitions for culture that he's been able to pull up. So I'd like to first mention to all of you here that my recognition about culture is that most people today don't seem to know what it is. Uh, the word gets thrown around, but when you pin people down and ask them for their definition of culture, you'll find that they really don't have one. Um, they'll often talk about things like the arts or music or um, language or beliefs, 
you know, and they'll say, you know, that's culture. Um, but, you know, sit there and think yourself for a minute, you know, what is culture and how does it work and, you know, what does it do and what's it for and why would we repair it and is it broken and who's to say that it's broken in the first place? But um, kind of like that word sacred, that word gets thrown around also and when you really pin people down for the definition of sacred, you'll find that they don't really have a clear definition for the word sacred either. They'll sort of associate it with activities or things. Um, but again, that word somewhat chases its own tail. And when you look at the relationship between sacred and culture, you'll discover that they're, they are completely interrelated and that partially the reason that sacred is hard to describe has everything to do with the fact that culture is hard to describe. Um, they're completely related, as you'll find out here soon. Um, there's an author by the name of William Powers, who's an anthropologist out of Rutgers University, and he's done a lot of work uh, on defining the word sacred with indigenous communities. And one of the indigenous communities he worked with a lot is the Lakota community, and where he, he speaks that language fluently and spent uh, at least 25 years living among them to do his work. Um, I knew an elder who passed on in 2007 who um, avoided the school systems and avoided um, the religions of the European people and only had mentoring and language from his grandparents who were ceremonial leaders and healers in their traditional ways. Uh, he grew up close to the land and close to the subsistence patterns of his ancestors. And when the rest of the people were put on reservations and isolated from their culture, this little enclave of medicine people, if you will, which is really the wrong word for them, but uh, it's the closest I can come to right now for this, the sake of this conversation, you know, the ceremonial slash medicine people, the healers of that tribe, there was 23 of them who gathered and lived together in this little enclave and they were deliberately separated away from the rest of the people on the reservation uh, by government policy uh, so that they couldn't influence their own people. And, you know, the separation of children from their elders was part of the process that, uh, quote, unquote, enculturated the, those native people into our society, if you will. Um, the consequences of that were devastating, but that's not what we're here to talk about. I, I'd rather focus on what it was that those cultural elders brought, um, the ones that were able to keep their knowledge and understanding of culture. Um, I got to work with a couple of them and very closely with one of them, Gilbert Walking Bull, for a number of years from about 1990 until his passing in 2007. And in those years, uh, gained a lot of understanding of the work of William Powers in his description of this word sacred and how it relates to the concept of culture. Uh, so I've explored this um, word sacred through traditional lenses worldwide to try to get a handle on it and its relationship to culture. And, and actually, you could take the word as it's, as it's uh, translated directly and literally from native language before it got the Episcopalian or Catholic spin that was put on it. Um, by the people who actually translated that word originally. And you could learn a lot because the word actually sounds more like a verb than a noun. And the word describes those things which bring us into closer connection with nature, with others, with self, with spirit, with God, whatever. Those, those activities, those processes, those objects, uh, those events, those elements in, in nature, those elements within ourselves, these are the things that are sacred. But the word self, if you look at it in Webster's Dictionary, it always refers to religious sacrament or things that have to do with uh, religious events. And then it's always associated with the particular religion that's giving the definition. So um, that's part of the reason why culture is elusive to us also, because it seems that there was a whole period in history where culture was taboo to get involved with or to talk about. And I, and I feel that there's residual fear in people today to get involved with concepts around culture because there's too many minefields within, it, within that word. 
um, you could get in trouble for cultural misappropriation, or you could get in trouble uh, messing with people's culture. You know, you could, uh, you know, it's not your job. It's someone else's responsibility to work with culture. But, you know, the, the truth of the matter is, um, if you go into uh, various ministries of the President of the United States and you look for the Minister of Culture, you're not going to find that person. And if you go into your state government office and look to see, you know, who's the Minister of Culture for the state, you're not going to find that person. And if you do find any references to culture on the state, federal, or county, or even municipal level, what you're going to find is referring to things like the opera or the arts. Um, you know, because for some reason in the Western world, culture now means going to the opera. So I'd like to ask you to just take all that and put it to one side of your desk for now or just put it in, in, a, in a cardboard box and just move it to one side for a minute. And let's clear our minds and, and refresh our, our mental screens here until they're blank and, and let's start again. And let's look at culture now as an action instead of as an idea. And let's eliminate this Wikipedia definition that goes on and on and on for a second and just put that aside. And I'd now like to talk about culture with respect to what it does, not what it is. And respect to what it does when it's healthy and as compared to when it's not healthy. So me, human beings require a healthy cultural ecology around us in order to be fully functional. And a healthy cultural uh, ecology has attributes that we will refer to uh, in this call. And by the time we're done with the call, we will have you know, covered the, the majority of the attributes that reflect a healthy culture. But you as a human being are designed on the ergonomic level, like the biological level, to respond to healthy culture. When you find yourself in a healthy culture, your being smiles. Your body smiles, your heart smiles, your spirit smiles. Your, you suddenly feel supported in a way uh, that's that's multi-dimensional and dynamic. You suddenly feel like you have permission to be your best. When culture is at its best, it gives us that. So let's let's start there and just think for a second about what culture does when it's healthy. Come with me for a moment um, and visit the oldest culture left on planet Earth, one that has been identified as genetically located in the place it always has been, and that's in the deep Kalahari in Botswana uh, with the narrow Bushmen. And again, if you happen to be in the Marin County area tomorrow night and you can get over to see this slideshow, I'm going to give uh, visuals and some video too collected from those people so you, you know you can actually see this firsthand. I guess that's secondhand through media, but um, get to see some of these things tomorrow night if you're there. Or Wednesday night, I'm sorry. The um, Bushman community has had little contact with the outside world. Uh, those missionaries have come to visit and have had some influence on them. For the most part, the Bushmen are fairly absent-minded around what they learn from, from these missionaries, and they they don't really have much... Uh, sign that they've been impacted by that because their culture is, is strong enough to kind of act like soil. It sort of composts the things that are irrelevant and strengthens the things that are really helpful and practical to them so that they they show up in their everyday life and are part of their present moment. So um, they have largely remained true to their identity and practice as Bushmen. Their language is intact. Their cultural practices are intact. Um, they are still hunting and gathering in the way of their ancestors. Uh, they have names for plants that have never been named by the Western world. So you could go into your, you know, your various field guides and from for Africa and, and not find those plants. They have yet to be identified by Western science. There's only Bushman words for those plants right now. Um, this particular community that I'm, I'm involved with is only been in that area. And for the 120 years that there's been white neighbors who 
know their history, they've always been there. And uh, when you ask those Bushmen, they only have stories from that place. They don't have an oral tradition that refers to anything else. So it's really difficult to know how long they've been there, but um, there's plenty of evidence that suggests that they've been there for as long as 50,000 years. Uh, the National Geographic Society has done a lot of research and uh, working with other institutions worldwide to create a giant map of all of our genetic history and, and tracking our migrations around the planet and then our family tree of relationships based on you know, genetic similarity. Um, and through that project, they have identified that the Bushmen that are still around in the Kalahari share 90% of the DNA with our common ancestor worldwide. So all human beings are related to them. And this is an important thing to recognize because, you know, if you, if you will, biologically and ergonomically, when you are with the Bushmen in their simplest and purest cultural form, you're able to get a look through the keyhole back to our collective ancestor which is looking through the keyhole back to what makes us tick as human beings. So what works best for us culturally, ergonomically, biologically, neurologically, it's all there in your face when you're with these people. And what you discover is that they have a, a very strong bond with their place, with one another, with themselves, with their ancestors, um, and all of these things are imprints or... Um, attributes of a healthy culture. A healthy culture, by definition, from my experience, and this is a practical definition. This is this is applied cultural mentoring that I'm about to refer to. It's it's not ideological cultural analysis. It's applied cultural mentoring. In other words, let's look at a dynamic group of human beings and let's build a healthy culture there and look at the results of it. In my thirty years of working with cultural mentoring, I've come to define culture as a process and not as a noun. A culture is a collection of processes, events, activities, items, concepts uh, that all fit together in, in an ecology that, when it's working well, connects people to themselves, it connects people to each other, and it connects people to their natural environment. And when connection to self and natural environment and others gets deep enough, uh, spirit moves within that. So when spirit moves in an authentic and organic, free-range, shade-grown kind of a way, when spirit just moves organically in a person uh, in an authentic manner, they discover uh, some sense of the sacred, some sense of the greater power that creates our universe. They understand there's a mystery. They feel the spirit that moves in all things, and they develop a deep appreciation and understanding and connection to their own role as interdependent beings within the creation. You know, So they, they basically feel connection to ancestry. They feel connection to unborn generations. And all this stuff is a sign that they've reached a state of vital health as human beings. Um, they actually become better citizens. They become um, better members of a community or a society. They become deeply dedicated to their neighbors, both uh, human and non-human. They take better care of their ecosystem. They take better care of themselves, uh, on and on. So. Again, just to say it simply, by connecting people to self, nature, and others, they will evolve, ultimately, a deeper sense of spirit, which will connect them to the creator, creation, you know, and a sense of interdependence, both through time and with others living around them in the present. That's why I am so interested in revitalizing and, and, and repairing culture, because if you could get healthy culture in every neighborhood, the result of that would be healthy people and healthy ecosystems. And you know, you cannot accomplish the same thing by imposing laws and rules and ideologies. If you have a motivated population of people who are acting intrinsically from their heart with deep commitment, things change. 
if you impose laws and rules from the outside, people rebel, people find ways to destroy and sabotage and, and ignore. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, a good friend of mine who I've been mentoring for many years um, said to me just yesterday, a couple of days ago in Boston, he said, you know, it's like my uncle means well, he's a good-hearted guy, you know, you know he cares, but he deliberately hides the bottles in his trash when he's putting his trash out because he doesn't want the government telling him that he has to recycle, you know, and and that's a common example. You know, there's a lot of people out there who, you know, know on some level that recycling is the right thing to do, but they deliberately don't do it because they're rebelling against authority, you know, so that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. These are all the unintended consequences of a uh, unhealthy societal structure uh, that tries to get people to do things by forcing stuff from the external instead of helping facilitate things from the internal. So good mentoring will help people come to conclusions from their own heart that will cause them to make choices from the intrinsic side. So mentoring is one of the elements of a healthy culture. It's one of the things that makes a cultural ecology function. So one of the attributes of a healthy culture is that everyone is experiencing mentoring. And everyone's experiencing mentoring as the main operating system. In our modern society, mentoring is very rare. It's an endangered species. Um, when you do find stories of mentoring, you usually find it within a very specific niche. For instance, uh, I can find authentic mentoring um, sometimes in in athletics, you know, so somebody has the same soccer coach for a year or two, uh, and mentoring takes place in that relationship, but it's usually within the context of soccer. You may find mentoring um, in places like the scouting movement or Campfire USA, or you might find mentoring in the martial arts um, or within in re religious environments. But often that mentoring is very specific to the niche that the person is involved with. In a healthy culture, um, mentoring is everywhere. You know, there's no uh, school system per se. For instance, in the Kalahari, they don't really have a school system, although the most recent generation is, is putting their kids on trucks and shipping them away to boarding schools because the Botswana government requires it. Um, which is an unfortunate reality, uh, but so the, the newest generation of these Bushmen will likely lose a good aspect of their culture, a good part of their culture, due to the influences of uh, schooling. Um, but that's, that's neither here nor there for this moment of the discussion. We can come back to that later. But in the Bushmen community as it stands right now, take any individual, and I'll just I'll focus on a 47 odd year old individual, they don't really know when they're born, they don't have birth certificates, and they don't really use calendars or day timers, so they don't know Monday from Friday, and they don't know 9 a.m. from 10 a.m., they're not really thinking about that. Um, they're, they're somewhat in the present, you know, if you want to talk to them about making an appointment, you have to tell them how many days out from now you're talking about. Um, so they can count sunrises, uh, but they don't, they're not so interested in the calendar. So now, because their kids have to go to school, they have to pay attention Monday to Friday. Um, but before the influence of that, when you take this 47-year-old person, who most of his kids have grown up, um, and you look at him and you ask him about mentoring, you'll find that he understands it. In fact, he just calls it sort of the way of life. It's just it's just the way they are. And they provide that for all the children in their village. And he can point to many, many people who are older than him who have been his mentors in that way. And he has long-term relationships with all of them. Even after they've passed on to the other side, he still feels a mentoring connection to them. And I can completely relate to that. Um, when uh, Ingwe passed on, who was a mentor of mine from 1984 through 2005 when he passed away. Um, you know, we lost his physical form in the world. And 
we traveled on to wherever we go when we leave this, this bodily form. But what didn't change was my relationship to his wisdom. And sometimes I'll be in a challenging situation um, and in a quiet moment within the challenging situation, I'll hear his voice inside my head tell me something that I've heard him tell me many times when he was alive. And suddenly there he is, and he's still mentoring me, you know, and he's been out of the lighted world, you know, for six years now. Um, but yet I feel like he's still mentoring me. And the same is true of uh, Gilbert Walking Bull. You know, I, I still hear him in the quietness of my mind telling me things that maybe when he told me the first time I didn't understand quite the way he meant them. But those memories stay within us, and our mentors stay as mentors to us long after the mentor's physical influence is gone. So there's, there is like a biological, neurological, spiritual, psychological sort of pre-programmed uh, interface designed into our humanness that looks for mentoring, stores it, and then time releases it throughout our life. So even when our mentors have passed on, their mentoring influence continues. Uh, mentoring is a form of adoption. And so therefore, you know, don't flippantly say that you are a mentor and that you're mentoring others. Uh, because if you do that, you'll, you'll sort of undermine the power and value of mentoring. You know, you would think in a certain sense um, in this postmodern world where culture repair is desperately needed, mentoring might be the first thing you're going to want to bring into your life. And you may want to bring it into the lives of others. Um, but it's not something you want to do flippantly or quickly or just because you heard about it on this call. Because mentoring is a form of adoption, it's similar to marriage, but to maybe a, a lesser degree. Um, you, you won't necessarily be living with the people you're mentoring. You won't be you know, sharing bills and household activities and raising children uh, under your roof with the people you're mentoring. But they become like nieces and nephews to you. And once you develop a mentoring relationship with others, they're going to come to depend on you and look to you for support for the rest of their lives. You, you don't uh, think uh, that mentoring and teaching are the same. They're not. Uh, we uh, are told by our, the professional standards of our postmodern society that teaching is a professional activity and you don't want to develop relationships with your students. You know, so you can't actually become friends with them. You know, you're the expert. Uh, they're the ones who have come to you. You're going to impart knowledge into their heads. So in the time and space allotted for teaching, uh, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Monday and Wednesday, you have a, a wrench that you use to open the bolts around their skull. You open their head. You shout a bunch of noise into it, and then you close it. Uh, and then you don't really pay attention to them beyond that time commitment that you have with them. You know, that hour and a half time slot, two days a week, is the, the time and place for the appointed teaching. And there is no relationship outside of that. Um, I would like you to really research where that model of quote-unquote education came from. And I will give you one resource that you can look into that will help you, even the title of it will help you understand the nefarious nature of what we call you know, modern education and how um, antithetical it is to cultural mentoring and how it, how it is in some ways responsible for the destruction of culture as it's passed on from generation to generation. The book is called The Underground History of North American Education, and the author is John Taylor Gatto, G-A-T-T-O. Um, he does the research that explains uh, when, how, and who we're involved with and created what we call modern day schooling. And the professional education model that we pass on as sort of the sacred cow never to be touched by our modern society, um, how that is essentially designed and what it's designed to do. So you can do that research on your own time and figure that out on your own time. I'd like to look at what we're going to do to repair cultural damage that has been caused by numerous influences through history. When mentoring is present um, to a critical degree, and there's a healthy ecology of diverse mentors in people's lives, people who are involved in mentoring grow powerful. They develop a deeper connection to themselves. They develop a deeper connection 
to their natural environment, they develop a deeper connection uh, to the other people that, that are in their lives that they trust and who treat them fairly with respect, dignity, and love. Um, they develop deep connection there, too. And through that, um, human ecology, that healthy human ecology, their light begins to shine brighter and brighter within them. They develop a personal sense of creativity, hope, vision, and power. Um, they develop uh, good problem-solving skills. They become much more sort of divergent in their thinking and their awareness. Their interdependence and their connection to others causes them to think for the nation as opposed to for themselves. Um, they, they develop this deep sense of concern for the well-being of nature and the future generations. And essentially, uh, they become empowered, visionary individuals. And when you look at the qualities that they possess, you would call them leadership qualities. So these are highly activated people that we're talking about. And they're the kind of people that know how to think on their feet and to move with resilient action and, and you know, definitive speed and confidence. So when things are challenging, for instance, during natural disasters or, uh, say, you know, things associated with wartime, um, people with those attributes uh, tend to be the heroes that pull people through. Um, they also tend to be wanting to stay out of the limelight, and they tend to be... Um, self-effacing. They don't want the recognition. They, they tend to be very humble. They're not interested in recognition for what they're doing. So they're, they're not doing it for political gain. They're doing it because it's the right thing to do and they know it in their heart. In other words, these are the kind of people you want as neighbors. Um, culture repair is essential for that to become the norm again. You know, if if we want empowered healthy, interdependent, happy, and hopeful, visionary people around us, we first have to put culture back in place because that is that is what will cause that to occur in the people we're describing. Well, go back in time to the days when the Romans were very active in essentially destroying cultures around them and then taking over the population of people there, men, women, children, uh, to become more or less economic pawns for their their empire. Um, the Romans developed a very specific technology, which I'll just sort of oversimplify by calling it divide and conquer. They developed a bunch of strategies that operated on the level of society that essentially went after cultural systems and destroyed them. For instance, separating elders from children. That's the easiest and most obvious thing to do if you want to destroy a culture. Just take the children away from their elders. Uh, another obvious and simple thing you can do is prevent people from speaking their language and make them learn yours. Um, the power of culture is often preserved within a language. Uh, the language often has within it ways in which to connect to the local nature uh, so that, you know, with nature connection locally, you're going to develop more power within the individuals within that culture. So, um, you know, one of the strategies that the Romans developed was to simply interfere with people's ability to, to deal with their elders, uh, be involved with their own customs and cultural activities, and instead the Romans imposed n new things that they would do. Um, and uh, essentially reorganized the way that the people lived in physical space and time. So a lot of divide and conquer strategy um, was, let's just call it viral and infectious, and that once it got into place within the living population, they became complicit in passing it on to the next generation. So in a certain sense, what happens is the people who grow up in a divided and conquered cultural experience um, take on the characteristics of divide and conquer within their own beings, and then they pass it on through the way that they manage their own children and their grandchildren and so on. In other words, it, it's sort of like you know abuse. It passes down through family lines and down through generations. Um, you know, because essentially divide and conquer is a form of abuse and it causes something known and defined by the United Nations as historic trauma. So if you research historic trauma on 
the Internet and study what United Nations websites describe as historic trauma, you'll see that the descriptions that, that they give for symptoms of historic trauma are pretty much virtually everywhere around us right now. And that's because we live in a war-torn society that has been war-torn for so many generations that we call it normal now. And we don't even really know what healthy culture looks like. So what we've come to accept as normal um, is anything but our birthright. I mean, you know, the, the quality of life that we could be experiencing is very different from what we've all accepted as normal. And to add insult to injury, many people call the current state of affairs from a societal slash cultural point of view They've come to call it mainstream. They've even come to call it responsible to participate in it. And if you should so feel called to do something different or in any way, shape, or form desire to change it or endeavor to change it, you might be looked at as irresponsible or even unpatriotic. Um, and that's because human beings are tribal by nature. And once a state of mind has been accepted as normal, we all support each other in that normalness uh, to a degree which uh, is actually a fault of ours, and it's, a, it's kind of like one of our weaknesses. We can come to accept a lesser state of goodness um, as the way to be and then punish people who desire to make it better or who have legitimate claim to visions and concepts to bring it to better. So we have this, this mess on our hands right now, and when I describe all this, you probably are sitting there thinking, oh, my God, it's hopeless, we'll never will never pull out of this nosedive. And, well, you know, sometimes I feel the same way, and I guess there's, there's plenty of reason for us to think that we, we won't pull out of the nosedive because, you know, if you look around at, at what's going on right now, statistically, globally, and you look at the headlines, it seems like war just keeps manifesting more and more and more, not less. Um, economic realities seem to be pulling us into a worse and worse direction. Environmental concerns, the same. Um, you know, where's the hope here in this whole story? Well, we're on this call, and Transition US, uh, our sponsor for this call, is one of the agents of hope that's working uh, its agenda in towns and projects worldwide to help pull us out of the nosedive by setting up a series of, uh, of action items that we can do within our regions. One of them, um, needs to be to influence the invisible structures, those things which build culture back into our communities so that we can have interdependent, resilient relationships with our human neighbors so that we can become better stewards and tenders of our non-human support systems around us called nature. And um, if we succeed in doing that, you know, the future generations have a hope. So where do we start with culture repair? Well, last week I spoke about, uh, and that wasn't last week, on the last call I spoke about peacemaking. And I described peacemaking as a cultural system that um, was taught for over a thousand years by the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, who um, originally were based out of New York State area from the Great Lakes over to Lake Champlain. Um, in an east-west uh, arrangement across the, the, the landscape there. But their, their model of treaty and peacemaking spread to numerous Native American nations over the thousand years that they um, were uh, acting without the influence of Europeans. And it had grown so large and so powerful that it was all the way down to the swamps in the southern states, you know, Georgia and that area all along the Atlantic seaboard, uh, right up along the, the St. Lawrence River into southern Canada, all around the Great Lakes, all the way out to the edge of the Great Plains. And so that's pretty much you know, half of the United States territory that I'm talking about. And it involved millions of people, and it was continuing to spread when the, the original uh, settlers arrived from Europe here. And our nation, the United States of America, was highly influenced by the work of the Mohawk uh, peacekeepers and, and mentors uh, who worked with Ben Franklin and uh, other influential figures of that period of history to very much influence the document that we were celebrating yesterday, you know, the Declaration of Independence, as well as the Articles of Confederation. 
Um, so peacemaking is already your story if you're from the U.S. And if you're not from the U.S., but your culture was influenced by uh, democracy as it's taught within the United States or uh, at the United Nations level, you were also influenced by the story of peacemaking. And to me, it is one of the most hopeful models of culture repair that I know. And it starts with um, a simple commitment and recognition that all human beings um, deserve to have a life of peace in relationship and balance with nature and with one another. So we should all be able to live a life where we don't have to worry about someone breaking into our house in the middle of the night and doing physical damage to our homes and our lives. Um, you know, we should all be able to experience a sense of deep felt connection and love for other humans but also for nature and that same feeling coming back to us uh, from nature and from people. And we described the, the three commitments of peacemaking um, on, in our last call. And to just quickly review them, one of them says that once we know and understand how to access that peaceful state where we feel part of nature, where we feel part of family, where we feel held by people, um, where we feel peaceful inside and we're operating from our quiet mind, you know, that's the state of peace, we're at our best. So when we're in that state of peace, which is at our best, then we go into the second commitment, which is choosing our best words when communicating with each other so that we choose our finest words, we speak carefully to one another, we think about the impact our words will have on one another, and we always go directly to people who we have concerns with. So, for instance, if uh, you know my friend Bob irritates me, uh, it's my responsibility as a peacemaker to go straight to Bob and not to talk to everybody around Bob, Sally and Mary and Marge and Mark and Steve and tell them what a, what a bad guy Bob is, that's not peacemaking. Um, that's the opposite of peacemaking. That's kind of poisoning Bob by laying all kinds of negative uh, traps around him in his community so that people learn not to like him also. Um, so that, by the way, is leftover historic trauma acting. You know, that's, that's divide and conquer acting through me uh, by destroying everyone's trust of Bob, including my own and maybe Bob's trust of Bob, you know, because uh, a society that gossips is a society that never comes together. So in peacemaking, um, the way I would approach that is to go to Bob coming from peace myself, and I would find that place inside myself I get to whenever I spend quality time in nature, sitting by a beautiful stream or listening to birds singing or smelling flowers and feeling that peace that I get from the earth into my body, permeating my being, and from that place, I speak to Bob, and I choose my best words, and I explain to him how uh, whatever happened that he and I shared affected me in, in the way that it did, so that he can hear that feedback directly from me. And then he and I would discuss that, him coming from peace and me coming from peace. Now, if in the second commitment of peacemaking, I can't uh, maintain my peace, it might be necessary for me to say to Bob, listen, I'm... I'm I'm coming out of my state of peace right now. We need to have this conversation later. Um, I'm, I'm not really in a good place right now. Uh, let's finish this later. That's That would be honoring peacemaking right there. Um, if the anger starts to rise and we start to get really frustrated with each other, it may be time to just hit the pause button on our conversation. And that would be a commitment in peacemaking. So start from peace, choose our best words in peace, listen to each other deeply, in that conversation, and then that leads to the third commitment, which is we always aim for unity. We try to find a place where Bob and I can find uh, a place of stability in our conversation. So we may go away not agreeing with each other, but we've agreed to disagree, and we we still um, have an open heart towards each other. You know, it doesn't mean we leave liking each other. It doesn't you know mean that we agree with each other, but we leave with respect for each other and dignity intact and the, the knowing that I can trust Bob to come to me with feedback and he can trust me to come directly to him. Um, that right there forms a resilient cord between Bob and I. Now I have a, uh, a thread in my community that I can trust that it's going to be there. I know that Bob's a person of his word. I know that even if something difficult comes up again for us in the future, I don't have to be afraid that Bob is going to try to politically destroy me by t saying all kinds of negative things behind my back 
or going on a radio talk show and assassinating my character uh, for all the listeners. Um, there's no political agenda involved in peacemaking. Peacemaking is, a, again, a very natural sort of grassroots organic process of authentic communication, authentic trust building, and, and rebuilding trust between people. So when we're doing culture repair work, we have to recognize that what needs to be repaired is the influence of divide and conquer uh, societal processes that go back to the Roman times and maybe even earlier. Um, I'm sure they do go back further than that, but the Romans got really good at industrial level export of divide and conquer as a policy, and they, they helped to train other colonial powers to do the same. And we happen to come from, in the United States, a one of the powers that developed the same kinds of policies and processes uh, and practiced them on the indigenous people in this country. And uh, you know, in some ways, uh, people still think that's the patriotic American thing to do, to export that kind of process to other places. Um, but the bottom line is that's historic trauma acting on our our society uh, on a policy level. And we've come to accept um, and define practices in our modern world today uh, as policy and normal that are actually still destructive to culture and that actually take away people's birthright to a life of peace and dignity. And so we need to educate ourselves first on the influence of divide and conquer uh, history and then recognize that we, this generation um, that we live in right now, the one that's on this call with me right now, we are the first people in history within the Western world to actually have the opportunity to acknowledge the impact of divide and conquer and historic trauma. We're the first ones that get to say, wow, let's look at the impact of historic trauma on our families and on, on each of us as individuals and not say, oh, look at the historic trauma on how it's acting on Chicago while sitting in New York. You know, um, Let's not be ideological about this. Culture repair means starting with the one place where you really can influence culture, and that's you. Um, you want to look immediately up line. You know, Look back over your shoulder. Look up your father's line. Look up your mother's line and figure out how historic trauma has played out in your family patterns and educate yourself as to understanding what historic trauma is and how it operates and what its symptoms are. And you'll come to realize, oh my God, I didn't realize it. I thought I had a relatively happy life and a happy family life and I thought my family was reasonably healthy. But I realize now that we were actually operating from a lot of these symptoms uh, that are listed under historic trauma. Um, and, it, and, it, and it doesn't even mean that your parents didn't love you or didn't do their best. Uh, it just means that they too had the same experience as children and their parents too and their parents too. And you have to go a long ways back to actually find the source of it. You know, For instance, when I backtracked over my shoulder and looked into my Irish family, it goes back to the, the Night of a Thousand Harps. Um, when the the English came over and collected all the uh, musical instruments and a lot of the storytellers and musicians and essentially burned the musical instruments in the square for everyone to see and made the, the citizens watch and told them that they couldn't speak their language, they couldn't practice their music or their dance or their customs or song anymore and that they would now have to live by British rule and according to what that meant at that time. Um, and that was the moment that my Irish ancestors uh, were conquered by my English ancestors because I have both ancestries within my bloodline. Um, and so what became quote-unquote normal was a less functioning cultural experience for the Irish at that point and the family that came to America during the potato famine here and settled in America here uh, that gave rise eventually to me on this call right now began to practice a lesser effective culture. They had to let go of aspects of their culture that would have been healthier for me to experience, but they didn't know that. They didn't know they had lost it because culture is like air. It's all around us, but we don't know what it is. We don't describe it. We don't talk about it. You know, so the first thing we need to look at is what what is culture, what's left of culture that's healthy, um, and, you know, what 
have we lost through historic trauma and when did we lose it? And once you start to educate yourself as to the, the, the processes of a healthy culture that make us connect to self, nature, and others, um, you, be, you can begin to make some strategic decisions and choices within your life and say, well, I'm going to choose to add these elements back to my life which will strengthen culture for me and for the people that I'm in immediate contact with. So one last piece on this. Um, that has to do with what what culture is made from. And we know that culture is any process, activity, object, you know, aspect of societal interaction that builds connection between self, others, and nature. Um, what are the connections made from themselves? You know, what what is the actual attributes of a connection? Well, when you really pick that apart and look at it, a lot of people agree that connection seems to be made from some quiet form of electricity that flows unseen between things. So, for instance, there's a electrical feeling that you have with a beloved pet that you have a deep connection with. You can almost feel this force field that brings you together with that other. Um, when that pet is lost, you grieve heavily, um, or you might have that connection, that feeling with a human being in your life. And when you lose that that human because you move to another part of the world or because maybe they pass on, you feel this tremendous loss and this vacancy and this gap. It has a physical sensation. Something has been taken away and you feel it. I had a great connection with my great aunt and when she passed away, I literally felt part of me disappear. There was a, a physical sensation within my being that when she left the world, the lighted world and moved on to wherever we go, I suddenly felt a gap in my own being. And uh, I, I worked hard to fill that gap, but I never could quite understand how to fill it uh, in my early 20s. I didn't know what that gap was or why it had formed, but I did, I did notice it as a physical sensation. So connection has a force field. And the force field, though science has yet to describe it, um, the influences of that force field are clearly known to all of us on an intuitive and common sense level. You might just call it love. But in our societal world today, love is often confused with, with sexuality, and, and those things become intermingled, and so we, we sort of lose sight of what love is in a purely sort of spiritual sense. Um, some cultures have multiple words for love. In the Western world, love sort of is a catch-all. Um, but if you could separate sexuality from the word love, you could see love as a bond, as a form of energy that has a quality to it that moves us in a particular way and causes us to feel a certain um, connection, desire to take care of, a sense of commitment and responsibility towards others, a intrinsic driven power source that makes us want to care, that makes us want to look after, that makes us want to nurture and tend. Um, and if you understand that connection is what we're after and that love is, is sort of the description of it, uh, the way it feels to us, then you have to ask yourself when you're doing culture repair work, what are the things that work in your life to strengthen love between you and others, you and yourself, you and nature. And when you start looking at that, you begin to realize that slow food movement is a, a movement towards healthier culture. Because what it's basically saying is that let's push back against this thing called the clock, which was an artificial installation um, that was imposed on us. It's not an organic, free-range aspect of being a human being. It was imposed on us from a commercial uh, society and a choice for commercial um, efficiency. You know, the clock is an imposition. It's an artifact of postmodern Western society. It is not an artifact of healthy culture. So knowing that, you're not going to give up your clock. You're not going to give up your calendar. You're not going to stop making appointments, and you're not going to quit your day job you have to understand that the clock needs to be looked at with a little bit of suspicion. It may just have a negative effect on you. 
For instance, one of the uh, Bushman elders uh, spotted me looking at a timepiece last year in the Kalahari, and he asked me if it was a timepiece, and I said yes through the interpreter. And uh, he explained to me that he didn't like timepieces because when people looked at them, the very next thing they did was usually rude. And I was fascinated by that definition in his mind of, of a timepiece. Um, but it is, it is your choice to be rude after looking at your timepiece or not. And if you understand that the unintended consequence of being married to a timepiece is the potential to be rude, um, then you can make the choice to not let the timepiece force you into rudeness. You can recognize that in this modern day and age, we both have to be responsible to a world that may be negative from a cultural standpoint, but at the same time, we're married to it. We have responsibilities there. We have mortgage. We have rent. We have, you know, we have to, you know, pay for our food. We have to, essentially, earn money. We have to earn a living, and those things may have this destructive cultural aspects to them. But if you're doing culture repair work, you have to live fully in both worlds. You have to bring honor to your commitments within both these, the, you know, the Western society's influences, as well as the need to, you know, to to sheet mulch the society and plant roots of good cultural practice again. So a good example of that is the uh, cultural, imp uh, cultural repair influences of the slow food movement. It's essentially saying, look, take time to have good conversation and to enjoy your food. Both of those things prove those connections, those, those ropes between us nature ourselves and creates love. So culture repair can be as simple as taking time in a timeless way. It might be two hours, which doesn't sound timeless, but you can agree that in this two-hour period, we won't look at our watch the whole time. We'll be fully present with each other. We'll listen to each other deeply. We'll find that place of peace within ourselves. We'll share the food and appreciate it and enjoy it and have gratitude for it while we're eating it. Uh, and we'll stay present to each other. And during that time, we'll experience kind of a shift in our own personal health and well-being. We'll actually experience two hours of healthy cultural practice. And during our slow food uh, activities with each other, we can explore our relationships and, and see if we could become mentors to each other. You know, we could begin to see that, oh, I have something I can offer you, you have something you can offer me. And you know, over weeks and months, you can develop trust and understanding of each other and then say, okay, uh, at this point, um, I could imagine myself in a mentoring relationship with you, and uh, it could organically grow out of that. So there are some good things going on from a um, you know, a modern perspective where culture repair is occurring. So let's look at a couple of others where culture repair is actually working. Um, the reevaluative counseling model, the RC model, otherwise known as co-counseling, is a model right now that's teaching healthy cultural practices just in the form of communication and listening. The nonviolent communication movement or compassionate communication movement, um, uh, as, as uh, founded by Marshall Rosenberg and other, other folks who have taken it worldwide, these things are influences on healthy culture. Um, Transition Towns itself is is uh, providing the conversation that we're having right now, which is giving us space for expanding culture repair. The Art of Mentoring is a program that's spreading worldwide that's teaching culture repair um, by modeling it, by actually creating a village where culture is looked at as something that we can influence with each other for seven days in a in an immersive community where we share and dance together in, in many, on many levels, uh, all aspects of culture repair, and we come to remember what it feels like to be in a healthy cultural setting. And that remembering may even be sort of, sort of on the DNA level, the archetypal level, as opposed to remembering from childhood, because maybe we didn't have that experience as children. Um, but your body certainly knows what it feels like and is waiting for it, because for you know, 100,000 years, we as human beings have longed for uh, that healthy culture, and in our longing, we have created it. You know, it's, I think the instinct called longing 
is the instinct that causes us to regenerate good things uh, for the next generation. That's part of where culture repair comes from. We're all designed to do it. You don't need to have a degree in cultural anthropology to understand how to do culture repair. You just need to know what a quality life feels like with other human beings. Um, you know, you need to reflect back on your life and ask, when was I feeling at my best with those around me and with myself and with nature and what conditions created it? And how can I recreate those conditions again now? What kind of commitments can I make now to actually help that along? You know, for instance, I can get involved in the slow food movement. Or, um, as Mark Morey from the H. Shields Institute likes to say, um, the slow... Uh, the slow everything movement or the great pushback, you know, taking back your life and creating space in your life for quality relationships and conversations uh, and things that help build uh, stronger bonds between us, each other, and nature. So, you know, in, in conclusion around this, um, you know, the, the bottom line for us is that we almost have to kind of put our right hand back behind us push against the wave of historic trauma that works through our families and through our society around us and say, hold on a minute, stop, you know, press the pause button and hold those influences back for a minute, create some space uh, looking towards the future and say to our neighbors and friends in our communities, what are the things that build the strongest bonds between us as neighbors, as friends, as family, as people part of nature, as people wanting to be connected to ourselves? in a meaningful way. What are the things that will create that for us in the coming year? And what can we do on our calendar to make that possible? And that's why I called on you know, Pete Bergen's name in the beginning of this call. I hope Pete's still with us. Um, because you know, Pete's a person who's acting right now in his region uh, to play the role of cultural minister. You know, I, I'm going to create the space here. I'm going to help uh, the people who are involved here at uh, Terra Firma Farms um, to make some space for kids to connect to nature, to make some space for people to connect to each other, uh, to make some space on a regular basis for us to come together and listen to storytellers and speakers and share food together. You know, um, you know, these are examples. You know, farmers markets are examples of culture repair. Fair trade is an example of culture repair. Um, you know, the Children in Nature Network is working uh, on an agenda that basically is. is is desperately trying to find ways to efficiently, effectively connect the American population back to nature in a meaningful way. Um, so there's a lot of influences right now in the world where culture repair is is being looked at. Um, the permaculture movement is an example of a culture repair uh, system that's moving worldwide. Um, I'd like you to adopt the concept of regenerative community design and to think about that for a minute um, in the context of everything I've, I've told you here. Um, regenerative means not sustainable, but beyond sustainable. Uh, sustainable means staying the same, more or less. Regenerative means improving. And degenerative means destroying. We've been on a degenerative uh, system for many, many generations. We have been degeneratively running our communities. Um, things get more and more expensive. The environment gets more and more destroyed. The social sector becomes more and more disheveled. Um, things are degenerating. What we need to do is regenerate. We need to stop, take time to be in creative conversations with each other, um, sit, listen to each other, and think about the things that build stronger communities and help us move forward in a powerful way. Um, there's a lot of movement in that direction. I mean, if you, if you look at the Regenerative Design Institute, um, regenerativedesign.org, um, there's a program on there that's as looking at that, the Regenerative Design Nature Awareness Program, RDNA. Um, you can look at Eight Shields Institute, which I represent, um, eightshields.org and look at the art of mentoring and try to get involved in what's going on there. Um, you can look at uh, um, a lot of models that link to both those models that I just shared worldwide that are actually doing their best to provide alternative spaces for us to work together and to think about the things that build stronger relationships between us as neighbors uh, so that we can build resilient community, not in terms of the numbers of ambulances and fire trucks we have, 
Um, those things are important, but resilience in terms of the strength of our bonds as people so that you know, when things get challenging, we can rely on each other the way the Bushmen do in the Kalahari um, without any need to be you know, complicated, political, and, and uh, bureaucratic. These people really know how to work together. You know, um, I told the story of the tale of two hurricanes last time uh, on the peacemaking call uh, where we talked about the aloha culture of the Hawaiian island Kauai that survived Hurricane Aniki um, and had this you know, disastrous storm that destroyed buildings and completely wiped out all the infrastructure. Uh, but after nine days without FEMA being able to land there, um, when they finally landed, they found that the people were doing just fine. And the mayor of Kauai testified and said that her belief was that the reason Kauai fared better than um, New Orleans did after Hurricane Katrina was because the Hawaiian people still had enough of a culture, the Aloha culture, uh, left that they actually had quality activities occurring in neighborhoods on a decentralized, informal level uh, on a consistent enough basis where people develop trust and concern and interdependence for each other so that when they really had to be interdependent, they were. It was natural for them because during peace times and during unchallenging times, they did simple things like potluck and barbecue on a regular basis. And, you know, so never underestimate the power of a potluck, um, especially if you can create some slow food elements and some peacemaking elements around the potluck, and you can open up good conversations on a regular basis within your community. Uh, those things can go a very long way. And obviously, you know, with thousands of years of cultural destruction behind us, we're not going to solve or even understand the fullness of culture repair in an hour and 15 minutes on a phone call. Um, so if I didn't repair your culture just now in the last hour and 15 minutes, please forgive me. Um, I uh, am a mere mortal. Um, I wish I was a superhero with great uh, celestial powers that within an hour and 15 minutes I could heal the culture of Mother Earth and get us back on track, but I'm simply not capable of it. Um, but I am a total, total geek when it comes to cultural repair uh, and cultural mentoring, and it is my life, it is my profession, it is my, my passion, and I'm wholly committed to doing that for as long as I live, and I hope that's a long time, um, because I really, really want to help the people have a much better life in the future than they inherited uh, through culture repair work. So again, if you want to know more, please visit hshields.org and stay in touch with us through our website there. You know, you can get announcements about Art of Mentoring. So there's one coming up here in August here in the Bay Area in California in the Santa Cruz Mountains, um, August 14th through August 20th. I will be there, as will many leaders from the world movement in culture repair and art of mentoring. Um, my wife, Mark Morey, uh, from the H. Shields Institute will be leading this one. So please join us if you can. And... Um, you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, connect again. And check out Nature Mentoring Community Online. The Thursday night calls that we run every week are dedicated to culture repair, and it's a slow and steady wins the race, uh, you know, drip a little bit in each week on Thursdays uh, for an hour and a half and have conversation and breakouts groups through maestro.com. That's another way you can get involved. Again, hshields.org will help you find that out, Nature Mentoring Community Online. Monday night calls are on Nature Connection, Thursday on People Connection. Um, both of which influence culture repair. So I hope I helped you. Um, you know, there's a there's a book that we published called Coyote's Guide to Connecting with Nature. There's some great techniques in there on on culture repair and peacemaking. If you want more, uh, it's a nice fat book. Um, lots and lots of great stuff, field tested and time tested, and a lot of good feedback on on the effectiveness of the models in there. So check it out. And that's what I have, and what I'd like to do now is open it for questions, and I don't know if Caroline or Carl will be facilitating that, but the first person I'd like to call on is Pete Bergen, and just ask uh, if we could get Pete Bergen's mic open and just have him tell us a little bit about what's going on Wednesday night. Thank you. You're, you're on, Pete, if you're... Um, okay. There you go. All right, thanks, John. Thanks for your passion and your commitment, and look forward to seeing you Wednesday night. So um, Wednesday night at Tara Firma Farms, um, we have what's called the Bull Sessions in the Barn, and we start with um, at 5.30 to 7, um, what I'm now calling health, Healthy Culture Hour instead of Happy Hour. So, <laughs> right so it's a, a potluck and music, and um, 
bring your own plate, and uh, at, then at 7 o'clock, John will present his story of the Kalahari. And so to get real like detailed information, like how to get there, um, you can visit terrafirmafarms.com or outsideinnature.com. And if you re- want to speak with me, you can dial 707-225-2404. And so that's basically from 5.30 till 8.30. We'll be out there kid-friendly. We'll have a lot of fun. And um, I just want to say I th- thank you to Tara Smith for opening up the opportunity for the things that we're doing there. And briefly what we're doing there is for the community, the first Wednesday of each month, we have the bull sessions in the barn, speakers come in. For the children, we have Nature Connection summer camp program scheduled. And in the fall, we'll have a nine-month homeschool deep nature, nature connection journey and after-school programs. And then for adults, we have like one day and weekend skills workshops. We're starting out with that. Things like primitive skills, tule weaving, earth to art projects, permaculture projects. And so you can find all that information on uh, OutsideNature.com and TaraFirmaFarms.com. All right. Great. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Pete. And I, I want to—I I called on Pete because I knew that he was one of those people on the ground who's actually doing culture repair. I mean, he's—he's he's been studying this for a while. He's been immersing himself in various models and watching what other people do. And then I just watch from a distance and see him making all the right decisions and causing things to develop and grow in his community in a really positive way. Um, and he's he's just one person, like anyone on this call. I mean, we all have the power to influence our communities uh, by understanding what culture repair looks like and then applying them in simple ways that are actually also fun. I mean, the thing to remember about culture repair is you know you're doing it right when your life gets better. <laughs> you know, you're having more fun, basically. Uh, culture repair is fun. It should be fun. Thanks, Pete, for that. Um, I see a lot of hands have been raised, but I'm going to leave it to... Uh, uh, Caroline if, or Carl, whoever's uh, doing that, to answer people's raised hands. Yes, uh, this is Caroline, and thank you, John, so much for this talk today. It was very moving, and uh, I've got pages and pages of notes from it, so thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And I wanted to call on Jonathan first, first, and then um, Heather, and uh, and then we have Elizabeth Marshall. So, Jonathan? Uh, Jonathan, are you with us? Uh, are you unmuted? Are you still wanting to address a question? Uh, if so, um, I'm going to give you another opportunity to put your hand up again. So, Heather, uh, you're next. Heather? Goodness. All right. Well, press the one key if you want to ask a question. Let's put it like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Elizabeth Marshall, how about you? You did have a one on your keypad. So. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Good. Oh, good. Hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Uh, listening to everything that's been said and just my own, you know, thoughts about all of this and, you know, it's almost like. <laughs> Like AA has this really successful movement for how to heal alcoholism in any community in this country, and any, I don't know if other countries have it. I'm sure they have their own form. You know, people with that addiction, they know where to go, and there's a process for them. And it's almost like, you know, how to create that for, you know, these ancestral wounds and, you know, And when I think about, like, this country, I I guess what I've thought about a lot is there's this deep unconscious wounding that has to do with, you know, all of our own ancestral wounds from our lineages, but also kind of what went down here. And I think a strong dynamic, you know, with slavery and Native Americans, and it seems to me that a part of that is there's some grieving that needs to take place there, some acknowledging And, you know, it does seem like a very deep process, and I just wonder, it's kind of like, you know, yeah, it's great to um, have the feel-good stuff, and that's so necessary, too, but I wonder how much of, if if that could be supported and brought to emerge, you know, how much of a catalyst that could be to kind of free up the energy. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I don't know well, if I'm 
Am yes, I you're, make, you're making perfect sense, Elizabeth. I, you know, okay. remember, go, go back and reflect on some of the things I said earlier in the conversation. What builds the strongest bonds between people? And far and away, the thing that creates the strongest bonds is shared grieving. Um, yeah. Well, when people grieve together, they really bond. And in the peacemaking work, uh, mm. they say that peacemaking is working best when grief mm-hmm. causes unity. You know, so for mm. instance, somebody in the community dies, and it brings people together around, uh, you know, the the mourning process. And the result is that friendships are even stronger, families are even stronger as a result of that passing. That's because good processes are in place. So, you know, reevaluative counseling and nonviolent communication. These both of those movements really focus on exactly what you're talking about, you know, looking mm-hmm. at historic trauma. On the collective level? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah? Um, oh. And looking at the impact on individuals, you know. it's it, We're all aware of that. But I was going to also offer uh, that other movements that are really helping culture repair are movements such as Mankind Project, for instance, which is, you know, men's grieving work and looks at historic trauma, or the work of the Animus Valley Institute, which looks very much at the kinds of things we're talking about right now, Elizabeth. Um, It just seems like how do you get it into every community that it's the AA? It's like, does that take catastrophe? Well, I mean, mean, it may. I think AA (laughs) is another example of a model that is doing culture repair uh, in its way. So um, to me, because the, the... the ecological destruction of our culture is so great and so enormous, it's going to take a very diverse ecological approach, multiple strategies operating in every community. Yeah. You know, so Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's just the way it is. We're you know, we're gonna have to and it's not a one size fits all. There isn't like um, you know, sign up for XYZ program and all of a sudden it's be- everyone's better. Um my my findings right working with communities is that different people need different things in order to get the work done uh, for themselves internally. So um, that's, that's also what's going on. But the good news is um, that there are literally tens of thousands of emerging healing practices that are occurring right now globally. Um, some of them are ancient and some of them are brand new. Um, some of them are within the framework of institutions and some of them are totally grassroots and informal. Um, but we are getting an enormous, you know, diversity of healing practices that look at past issues that are emerging right now, which is very, very cool. So, yeah, but thanks for bringing that up, Elizabeth, because it did, I did kind of make it sound a little too feel-good. I think you're right. Um, oh, no, 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 I didn't, I didn't actually mean that at all. I just, I guess I'm just sorting out for myself what's the best way to use my energy and maybe what's the low hanging fruit for me and right on. No, I didn't I didn't mean that you were glossing that over at all. I was just kind of processing that for myself, you know? Yeah, well I thanks for processing it because I I really do feel thanks. like I, I should have I should have put more light on that, um on the on the dark side. I should have put a little bit more light on the uh, dark side. But well I just wonder, you know, like how much of that is blocking people being really able to, you know. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. I think I think that's the name of the game right there. I think it's the most yeah. important thing we can do. Well, thank yeah. you. We have we have one more person with their hand up. We should get to them, Elizabeth. Thanks for your wonderful yeah, contribution. Yeah, yes. And thank that's you. A, um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Caroline Rogers. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, I I guess I, I had a couple questions. I I think it's one is a question and inside of a question. Um, a lot of the things that uh, you're saying. Um, I think are the things I've been trying to express myself, but I, I don't know if I'm maybe completely understanding it, but it, it, <clears throat> it seems like a lot of the environmental uh, movement seems kind of angry uh, to me. And, and I grew up, I grew up with this um, kind of a, a loathing, a self-loathing of people um, because of, of what, you know, we're doing with the earth and all this other stuff, which is my, my kids used to be in Reiki's, and I, I liked Reiki's because that was not in there. And, and I've, from what I've read, uh, listened to um, of your CDs, it sounds like that's, that's, you know, you recognize part of that. But um, I didn't know if you would agree uh, with it being kind of angry I, I, until just uh, this talk that I've listened to now and um, the way it seems to me that that's being expressed um, for me in a way that really affects my life is um, I grew up playing uh, in Fairfax in this creek at Perry Park I don't know if you're familiar with it but um, now they're trying to not let 
kids play there, and I really desperately want my kids to be able to play in any creek, but, but, and, and I care about the salmon and everything. I'm not saying I don't care about that. I, I do, and I see their point. But at the same time, I think the reason I care is because I grew up playing in that creek and other creeks. Also, well, San Anselmo Creek, but Fairfax is easier because it's near the park and everything. And I, um, I didn't know. I haven't. I've been struggling with how to address this issue because I, I haven't been able to put into words um, what I think you put into words so well on this call. And uh, I was. I, I didn't know if you had any either advice or if you would disagree with my take on it or anything. So I was interested in that. Well, Carolyn, thank you. Um, I would fully support your point of view on that, that the reason you care about the creek is because you got to play in one as a kid. Richard Louvre definitely, definitely has tons of research on that very thing on the Children in Nature Network website. Um, and I, I don't just look for Children in Nature uh, Network on Google, and you'll find that amazing website with all of its research. And um, I think he would completely support that. We need children to be able to play and have access. He says one of the biggest issues right now in disconnecting the modern public from nature is access issues. It's number two on the list. Number mm -hmm. one on the list is fear, um, the, the, the fear that if you let your children outside, something bad will happen to them because of all the headlines that are always out there about all the terrible things that happen to people. Um, yeah. So that, so that I, I would, one, agree that access for children to nature is really critical. Um, I don't think you'll be able to get that across to people if they don't fully believe that. They won't believe it. So, you know, being strategic and understanding how to even influence policies is tricky because the policymakers are also disconnected from nature according to the statistics. Um, you know, very few people have an authentic nature connection anymore. So when they make policies like that, they're not really thinking about the cultural influences on the next generation. They're thinking about the immediate results of saving the salmon and thereby losing the long-term results of a caring population um, that would actually be care, would even care if there were salmon. Uh, so sometimes we're a little penny-wise and pound-foolish in that way. But the other part is, yes, I would agree that a lot of activist movements, not just the environmental movement, but a lot of activist movements um, are actually literally formed out of anger. And anger is usually the result of unprocessed grief because no one's hearing me, no one's listening to me, and you get more and more frustrated, so you become activated. Uh, and that's activism almost by definition is uh, often associated with anger. Um, Uncle Gilbert Walking Bull used to tell us that, you know, because we were very much angry and activated <laughs> in the years he was around, uh, he said, you guys think you're getting something done, but, you know, you're marching around holding up signs and all you're doing is alienating, you know, the brothers and sisters of your population who could be your friends and allies, you know, what you, right. what you really need to do is build, you know, he would say, build relationships with them and understanding and caring um, and, and develop deeper connection to nature for everyone. And that was the platform that he always drove home with us, which was coming from a place of profound wisdom. Uh, but he also recognized that the reason we were angry was because no one was hearing us and we felt unheard and upset. So he gave us the opportunity to really express ourselves and to cry and to feel those things within ourselves uh, in the context of his Anipi ceremonies and because we got to grieve, our anger subsided, and we were better able to work with each other. So going right back to what Elizabeth said, you know, we need to grieve the things that we feel the losses around. Um, and once we grieve them fully, we can become much more functional in our communication process and more effective in cultural repair and cultural influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for bringing that forward. Um, John, there's three more hands up. Why don't we just see if we can grab one or two more, Caroline, okay. and then we'll, we'll call it a day. I really appreciate the good questions here. That's okay, great. so Palika, you're, you're next, and then we have Amy Beam after that. Let's see. Oh, where did Palika go? Go over to Washington, D.C. and pick up Amy. Okay, Amy. Yes, hello. Hi, Amy. Hi. Well, I didn't know you were just in Boston. I was just there, too, and I just wanted to share an anecdote from that region. I was visiting with Rachel, who was my preschool student when she was two, and she uh, is now 30 years old. And she just got married up in Vermont to Jeff, and both of them have been to Art of Mentoring, and Rachel continued and went through uh, Mark Morey and Miriam Drawer's CNAP, and then Rachel also works in another group with Miriam Drawer. And they decided to have a great big 
four-day wedding model uh, after, you know, community. And so they invited a bunch of friends, rented a big inn in Vermont, got a bunch of local food or brought up eggs from their own chickens and tomatoes from their own garden, and it proceeded to pour. And it was raining, raining, pouring, pouring for this mostly outdoor wedding. Oh, my gosh. And, and so, you know, they have all of the uh, the older relatives, all the young babies and all the people there, oh. and had to quickly come together and deal with the weather. And so they all went out and got hay and straw to make a big thick floor because it was just so mushy that the chairs were sinking into the ground. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, and then the heat and the in the building the hot water went out and so people started boiling water and filling up bathtubs so that people could have hot baths after being out in the chilly rain and uh but you know that didn't interrupt the capture the flag game and it didn't interrupt the stomping in puddles and or the you know cooking marshmallows on the very um damp uh beautiful roaring fire made from the very damp logs thanks to the primitive skill community that was there in force <laughs> And uh, and the one of the two really touching things uh, for me, very poignant, well, three actually I can think of, they just asked everybody to put on a little um, variety show act. And so some were very good, great talent. Some were just very sweet, and some of them were funny, and some of them were just awful. But they were all enjoyed. And then they had their wedding, and Rachel had converted to Judaism to marry Jeff because this was very important to him and his family. And rather than stomp on a glass, they explained to everybody that they had decided to stomp on a pine cone because they just didn't see the good full purpose in uh, destroying something that had been so intensive to make. So they stomped on the pine cone. It made a delicious crunch. And, and everybody, you know, understood it because of their beautiful explanation of it. And then um, the thing that I personally found so moving is that they listed family members, and they had listed me as a family member because I had been with the family for so long and had been enlisted as, as the mom and dad said, the other mother. Oh. And, uh, and so they acknowledged that relationship that she and I had had all these years in that uh, community celebration. So just all around, it was this amazing good time that just, exemplified uh, a lot of the points that you were discussing, and I just wanted to share it. Well, that's good. That's another hopeful story from the real world. And uh, mm -hmm. it sounds like the wedding was a success regardless of the weather. <laughs> and and what everybody walked away with was, wow, what community. Nice. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. Don, we, have, we had Polika back for a moment, but it looks like I've lost her again. But we've got Donna Halit. And then yep, Donna Halit. Call it, call it a day. That would be great to hear from Donna. And I just wanted to also let you know that we've been talking kind of in an American-centric kind of way, but I see people from Germany on the call and from other parts of the world. So I just want to honor you, too, because I know you're all doing good work out there. So thank you. And Donna. Hi, John. Hi. I just wanted to offer one other resource for the um, for the grieving piece, and that would be the work of Sabon Fusome. Yes, thank you. She, yeah, she's from um, a small West African nation of Burkina Faso, and she brings her... Um, her ceremony, her grieving ceremony to people, and it's it's a phenomenal experience to grieve in community and have that witnessed and have that grief transformed. So you might want to look that up as well on the internet. Yes, thank you. And and mm -hmm. uh, and Sabonfu has visited this community here in our area, and I agree with you 100%. And I also that makes me think of Joanna Macy's work mm -hmm. and um, and so many other good good organizations that are supporting grieving. So thanks for bringing that to our attention, mm -hmm. Donna. And Good to hear from you, and good for, to have been part of this three-part series with everybody. I uh, appreciate everyone taking the time to, to visit us. Um, I don't know if you could take Kirsten Segler, who I know is in Germany. Caroline, maybe we can just hear from yes, her real quick. Yes, it, it, it's up to you, John. Yes, yeah, let's, right I, ahead. I've got the time. Go okay. ahead, Kirsten. Hello. Hello. Do you hear me? I hear you great. I just wanted to add, to add that Sabon Fusume will be in, in Germany in November because Elke um, is, is organizing um, a class about grief. Super. And so everybody who's, who's in Europe, um, just uh, can just uh, email me. Uh, it's uh, K C 
Segler, S E L uh, S E G L E R at gmx point uh, um, dot de, and um, yeah, I will provide the information. Great. So that was K S E G L E R at gmx dot de. Correct. Yes. Right. Great. Thanks, Kirsten. Good to hear your voice, and I guess I'll see you soon. Yes, you do. Actually. Oh. All right. <laughs> Excellent. You fly around a lot these days. I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> uh, so, see you next week then. Very good, Kirsten. Thank you so much. And I wanted to thank you, John, for yet another incredible um, opportunity to really dive deep and to examine um, and to wake up parts of ourselves. Um, I really deeply appreciate that, and I appreciate you offering that to the community at large and the transition community as well. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to reciprocate and help you in, in some ways too unseen down the road. Um, definitely uh, strong support from Carl and I in the office for your work and uh, anything else we can do to support you and your work, please do let us know. So very so, much. I, yeah, appreciate so, that. I appreciate having had the opportunity to speak to so many good people in so many places through this uh, venue. Thank you. Yeah, Carl, I'm not sure, but I'm wondering if you can unmute everyone and we can all say goodbye. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that you can hear, we can all hear each other. Um, Hello. 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 Love everyone. Ah, Christina. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Hello. Bye. Bye. Peace and love. Always, forever and ever. Bye.